This game's kind of doused in tips now, isn't it? You can sleep after 21 o'clock. Sleeping heals all of your health and morale. Click. Most people will settle for bed after 21 or not long after. At night, the streets are emptier. By 2, everyone's asleep. See a container you can't open? Equip a pry bar. There's, there's like all this stuff going on here. And like the controls are all listed here. Interesting. It's just detailed. Alright, I got a book. I think I fucked up already, so... Hmm. I'm gonna pay the consequences, aren't I? Yeah, this is a problem for later. This is a problem for between recordings, me. But, uh... Uh, I think I have to pay for my room by 21 o'clock, or they won't let me pay for the room. Uh, but you still can't sleep anywhere besides the room, so you get soft locked essentially. I think that's still a problem, which is just a weird element of this game. For a game that has a role called Hobo Cop, you'd think that you could just sleep in the streets and then suffer some kind of consequences for it or something, but... I think at 21 o'clock they don't let me pay for my room, so I already passed that by the time I started this, so... <sighs> There's a good chance I'll have to replay literally the entire last episode. Uh, well, the entire communist meeting in order to uh, just get to day five. Because I'll have to go back in time, pay for my room, collect enough room to, money to pay for my room, pay for my room, then do the entire communist meeting and read the book, and then get to tomorrow, and so on. Oh well, that's a problem for later me. And by later me, that could be like 20 minutes from now. But they gave me ein Buch. Somewhere. Interact? There it is. A brief look at inframaterialism. A concise introduction to inframaterialist theory intended for a general audience. You can tell this particular copy has spent a long time in someone's back pocket. The cover of this pocket-sized volume features a swirl of orange, yellow, and green. The title, A Brief Look at Inframaterialism, is set in an authoritative yet approachable serif font. Authoritative yet approachable? What an interesting color palette. It's vibrant, yet somehow leaves you ever so slightly nauseated. Like this game? Like just all of the game? On the inside jacket flap, you find a brief summary. What is inframaterialism? A highly theoretical branch of Mazovian communism? A collection of mystical ramblings by a discredited revolutionary? Or possibly both? This brief look, TM, introduces readers to one of this century's most fascinating and misunderstood theories in a concise, jargon-free manner. So far, so good. You turn to the table of contents. The guide itself is divided into several sections with seemingly esoteric titles like Effects of Plasm on Root Vegetables and Mental Projection and Transference. There's also a brief introduction about the life of Ingus Nielsen. Read the introduction on Ingus Nielsen. Known to his numerous admirers as the evangelist of the revolution and to his even more numerous enemies as the apocalyptic Shrike, Ingus Nielsen remains one of the most controversial and fascinating figures to emerge in the years of the anti-centennial revolution, second only to Krasmazov himself. During his unparalleled life, he helped guide a revolution in one country and found a new state in another. Along the way, he committed some of the most notorious war crimes in an era famed for its atrocities. And yet, his most fascinating contribution to history may be the most overlooked. His theory of ideological plasm from which his followers and successors developed the school of communism known as inframaterialism. All right, not off to so much of a great start anymore. Uh, start reading the first chapter. If you're like most people, you probably believe that your thoughts reside in your brain, right? Kind of, and then also like extended nervous system stuff because like a brain in a jar would probably, even if it was somehow alive and conscious or whatever, probably wouldn't really be fully human because of how much you're really interconnected to, to the whole of yourself. Completely backwards. You think with your hands, always have. 
interfacing shut up i know you that you're really powerful and taking over my brain and all that with your eight but i'm gonna need you to chill i know you're my favorite thing and i put so many points into you until i had to really compose myself and then mostly fail to do so today but it's not your time to shine even though i do think with my hands Honestly, I have no idea where some of these thoughts come from. This sounds more like a question for a psychiatrist. See also a brief look at psychiatry. But let's stick with Ingus Nielsen a moment. You can't critique me, you're a book. As Mezzo's devoted comrade and leading theoretician, Nielsen was responsible for developing much of the intellectual foundation of communism. But his interests and speculations were famously wide-ranging. During his final years in exile, he produced, among other things, an early guide to home brewing, instructions for raising revolutionary children, plans for a universal pictographic language, and a detailed materialist critique of Dolores Day's chess strategy. A true man of ideas, equal to any of the great DeLorean polymaths. Oh yeah, ch chess analysis. I'm fully engaged but one subject he returned to time and time again was the fundamental relationship between thoughts and matter if you say schrodinger's cats i swear to god we may yet discover he wrote in his notebooks that under certain exceptional circumstances the proletariat's embrace of historical materialism may be so fervent that their beliefs take form in the world of matter as a kind of revolutionary plasm. Hold on, can you put that in slightly more basic terms, book that I can ask questions to? Certainly. In essence, Nielsen is arguing that thoughts don't just reside inside the brain, they radiate outward from it. According to this idea, the brain is an ideological transponder, constantly emitting waves of highly politicized energy, which Nielsen called plasm. The brain is a politics radar. And it. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa is right. What's more, Nielsen speculated that this plasm, when it becomes powerful enough, might begin to influence the material reality surrounding it. Hence the name Infra Materialism. Alright, this wasn't what I was expecting from the communist talk, but okay. Unfortunately, Nielsen passed away before he was able to develop these initial ideas into a full-fledged theory. That work was left to subsequent generations of communist theorists. Did you just say unfortunately the war crime guy passed away? Building on Nielsen's basic insight, these theorists reached a startling conclusion that a sufficiently revolutionary state might begin to exhibit certain extra physical effects based on the amount of plasm generated by its citizens. Wait, so this isn't even Nielsen's theory, it's his followers? Correct. Though certain particulars of the theory are commonly attributed to Nielsen himself, the evidentiary basis of those attributions has always been a point of contention between inframaterialists and their critics. So these people are saying that if enough people just believe in communism, it'll come true? Like... Like the Fables comic series, but without it's not about a wolf, it's about communism. <laughs> the actual theory is highly technical, but for the purposes of this brief look, TM, that's a fine working definition of the concept. I mean, that's a stupid way to describe it, like it's a force or some shit, but that is how I ideology works. If enough people believe in it, then it's something that's to be taken seriously and an actual force in the world and could be a thing that... I said force, so I guess this is how you fall in the trap. Uh, but that's how it becomes an actual movement and an actual thing that people t like take part in. Doesn't mean it's an actual, actual force, though, that's like observable. It's just that a bunch of people are actually paying attention instead of ignoring said thing. I guess maybe this is just useful for getting not very smart people to just kind of go along with this idea. So far we're off to a bad start. 
Actually, it's probably not a great idea because it's. In the, the um, it's like a, it's like me talking about building with zero point zero 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 one percent and so on myself, by just kind of thinking about it a bit. And now these people like, their active their their way of. Of engaging with this is to just lock themselves away in a private room no one else can get into, and just talk to each other back and forth about it, which is good for like developing ideas in your mind and so on but also not great for actually affecting world change you can't just like concentrate hard enough and then eventually it happens that's because this is absolute idiocy not even worth engaging with and that's why you're on my wall but i guess then again so is conceptualization really it's just they're Two of my favorite ideas and also my favorite paintings in this game. So I so I printed them out. Alright, let's hear about this extra physical stuff. Inframaterialists divide the extra physical effects of the revolutionary state by the level of plasm required to achieve them. At the lowest or first level, revolutionary plasm is believed to stimulate or invigorate matter without altering its essential properties. How exactly does the plasm stimulate matter? To take one example, during the revolutionary period, many communard farmers in Grad reported extraordinary yields of certain root vegetables, most notably turnips. The difference in these yields was simply too great to be accounted for by mere climate or soil conditions the only reasonable explanation, inframaterialists argue, is the high level of revolutionary plasm emanating from the commune itself. I didn't think that we could get even less based in science than like playing music for your plants, but here we are. Even today, in parts of the SRV, there are collective farms whose root vegetable yields exceed those thought possible by capitalist agronomists. I think that might be more of a symptom of com of a of capitalism than an upside of communism. <laughs> I think it's just the, the just basic inefficiencies and just the ways that like we're wa like we're watching on just like a, a a massive scale the way that capitalism just does not necessarily breed creativity or real competition or thriving in any real way. It doesn't give you the best product. Uh, it often just leads to cynical rule cutting and corner or rule breaking and corner cutting and it incentivizes people to find alternative ways to win than actually playing the game because the we all the the biggest seems like the biggest trap you can fall into is believing that it's about get, get, uh, produ uh, producing the best product for the lowest price in like the honest way that you're taught in an elementary way in school it's just like naive and embarrassing now the real way is to completely find ways to s cut around the system entirely and essentially cheat and and then, then you just do your best and I, I uh like the entirety of how amazon works and, and elon musk and so many other people and so many systems that just aren't about that like amazon didn't become the top bookseller which is the kind of how this all this whole thing started even before it was a big shipping company and so on by being like the best bookseller and and competing honestly in the market it largely cheated the system and most social media platforms don't even need to like generate revenue they just become <laughs> it's just fucking bizarre it's, it's, it's they, they essentially run on plasm people just believe in them and then they exist and it's they and they ride the wave of people believing them and that becomes funding and somehow they coast on that for like over a decade in many cases without ever becoming profitable and some of them still aren't profitable despite being life like world altering forces and they still don't generate money but they thrived under capitalism somehow because of the plasm <laughs> mm. and i just think about bizarre things like in the more lighter tone of stuff just the bizarre elements of like Rise of Skywalker, created by Disney, or the more recent Cyberpunk 2077, and it's like, these are some of the most high-budget projects made by some of the most successful companies that have all the resources and are supposed to be at the top of their game, and here they are making 
like they have the some of the highest value properties and they have so much and they're and they're it's just everything it's like this is peak of what capitalism can bring and you watch as they just they just collapse they can't the, the top of the the top, the top of the food chain is still just full of people that don't know what they're doing seemingly and it's it's fascinating or at the very least uh, they, if they know anything, it's at, it's at best how to make money and not how to actually make a good product in the process of making money. Because they found ways to make money without making the good products. It's a fascinating loop. Who's to say the farmers aren't just cooking the books? Sounds like obvious SRV propaganda. That's the other thing. Uh, it could easily be uh, just false data. In fact, uh... The more totalitarian your regime tends to be, the more you tend to just North Korea that shit and just lie about what's happening. So the data isn't likely to be reliable, actually. It's also been postulated that plasm may account for the remarkably full and manly facial hair observed on some communist males. <laughs> Stroke your bare chin. Don't, it's embarrassing. I, I'm past embarrassment. Your hand feels clammy against your bare chin. You wipe it along the back of the book and keep reading. I shaved my communism beard. <laughs> of course, inframaterialists argue that revolutionary plasm may stimulate human physiology in other ways as well. In fact, reports from the revolutionary period claim that the most radically devoted communards were able to engage in vigorous intercourse for up to eight hours at a time. There's not a lot of things I could do for an hour without getting bored. Eight hours? There's no way. Your equipment would be mashed to jelly. Oh, I didn't need that phrasing. No wonder the communards couldn't shoot straight. They were too shagged out. Hyperproductive vegetables and ultra horny communards are fine, but this theory hasn't quite gotten strange enough for you. Yeah, let's get weird. Hit, hit me with the weird horsemen made by a tech company or whatever the fuck. And on that note, you feel like you've gotten the general idea of inframaterialism, enough to carry on a basic conversation at least. But. If you'd like to go even deeper into some of the more speculative aspects of the theory, you could always read further. Don't ask where that was from, you'll spoil you'll spoil something for yourself. <laughs> Don't check. Of course you want to go deeper. What else are you here for? The book fits quite snugly into your palm. It would also fit comfortably into a jacket pocket. Keep reading. We have to go in deeper. You flip forward a few pages until you come upon a chapter titled Mental Projection and Transference. When a community has achieved a sufficiently high degree of revolutionary fervor, inframaterialists believe that second level effects may be observed. At this second level, certain hyper-revolutionary individuals may even develop the ability to extend their thoughts into material space and vice versa. Wait, does that mean communists can read minds? According to inframaterialist theory, yes. Under suitably revolutionary conditions, that is. It's become something of a folk legend that during their final meeting, Nielsen and Mazov didn't speak a single word, preferring to sit in silence with their chamomile tea, reading one another's thoughts. Chamomile, he lost me. That's probably not what happened. One of the minor tragedies of the late revolutionary period is that few reliable accounts survive. Much of what we know of the communards' activities during this period come from memoirs and second-hand accounts, some only written down decades after the fact, and of dubious authenticity. History is questionable that way. It's a little bit like how uh, the universal representation of what people will imagine when they think of fascism and the Nazis and so on was based on propaganda created by the Nazis. So when uh, Star Wars has its marching stormtroopers with these high aerial shots of these grids of people walking and so on, it's literally just 
evoking the direct imagery of this not Nazi propaganda film that was made back in that time. And like, that's the number one image that sticks in people's mind was the image that they created to be in your mind. So why do these effects only work for hyper-revolutionary communists? Because plasm has never been directly observed, the exact mechanism behind these effects remains entirely speculative. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the game where we thought the phasmid wasn't real. This should be more than enough for a stimulating discussion. That said, if you're still yearning for more... Finish it. You breeze through the next several sections until you arrive at the final chapter, titled A Communism Above Reality. When a society's revolutionary fervor reaches the third and highest level, Inframaterialist theoreticians have postulated that the laws of physics cease to be laws. Cease to be laws? Where do they become then? More like suggestions, according to some of the SRV's leading inframaterialists. I, I knew it. I was literally about to say, like, more like suggestions as like a joke. Of course, it's impossible to say what exactly happens under these conditions. No known society has ever achieved the levels of revolutionary enthusiasm the theory seems to require. It's, it's fan fiction, then, of reality? Some inframaterialists have even argued that it might require more plasm than humanity alone may be capable of producing. There's only one answer. Communist good boys. Wait, what, are there non-human sources of plasm? In the SRV, there have been attempts to organize certain species of aquatic mammals, as well as a few of the higher corvids. Why did you not start with dogs? But, as of this writing, only human beings have demonstrated the intellectual capacity for revolutionary communism. Has anyone ever gotten close to reaching the third level? Boy, this sounds like scient Scientology. There are numerous stories from Samara involving bandits or fascist mercenaries being levitated by farmers from the most ideologically advanced communes. Of course, few of these incidents have ever been rigorously investigated or substantiated. I think we'd be pretty aware if we lived in a world full of like airbenders or bloodbenders. The form of these stories also recalls several well-known Samaran folk tales. In particular, the one commonly known as Clever Oleg and the Flying Magistrate. Okay, that's a children's story. You can't trick me. Among known attempts to channel third-level capabilities, the most well-documented is the curious case of Coalition Warship Debutante. Nothing makes me believe in a story more than calling it the curious case. I've got to know what that's about. It concerns an interesting series of events that took place during the invasion of Revishol. Unfortunate events? As coalition forces made landfall, a cadre of Nielsen's most fervent acolytes attempted to compress a coalition aerostatic with their collective will. What's an aerostatic? A e aerostatic? Is it like a plane or a air water air balloon or something? Like something that doesn't have to like fly? Hey, I was right. It's a it's a uh, balloon. Yeah, it's a hot air balloon. It's, it's like aerostatic, something that's in the air but doesn't move, I guess, or can stop moving. So it's just, it has to be like a a balloon or a helicopter. According to Communard law, these acolytes positioned themselves at the top of a redoubt just over the bay of Rivershaw. From that vantage, they proceeded to visualize pinching coalition warship debutant between their fingers, a gesture believed to assist in the extra-physical materialization of their thoughts. <laughs> they literally did the thing where you look at something far away and you put your, you pinch it with your hand. It's like, haha, from this perspective, you are small. <laughs> I'm a big man. <laughs> like children. They are children's stories. <laughs> This is a children. This is a children's storybook that has been like the cover slipped off, and a different one got put on in, in a printing mishap. And they're like, "I know this is, this is an ideology now," which I mean, like, given how most I, a lot of ideology cult situations go, like, not the worst plan, I guess. Like, I guess you could just take Peter Cottontail and just like 
replace it with a fucking cover that says Communist Manifesto and just see how things go. Can't go worse than Scientology. Itself just being written by a fiction author. That, I'm, always, I'm always so fascinated by that, but that a guy made a bunch of sci-fi books and then he wrote a sci-fi religion and he's like, I know how to make more money. <laughs> I'll call. I'll just pretend this one's non-fiction. Just change the label on the outside, and I'll make millions. Oh God! Should have used pi finger pistols instead. Aim your finger pistols toward the bay. There's no evidence the communards were equipped with finger pistols, though it's unlikely they would have decisively altered the outcome. That spirit gun. Don't you watch anime? The Acolytes, along with the Redoubt, were vaporized in an artillery strike before the process could be completed. It's been said, though, that in the weeks following the battle, the captain of the debutante noted an increase in the incidence of crewmen striking their heads on unexpectedly low bulkheads. Of course, colorful anecdotes only scratch the surface of what inframaterialists believe may be possible in a truly third level society what would a third level society even look like some have theorized that such a society would be fundamentally unrecognizable lacking many of the institutions we typically take for granted in advanced societies including organized governments financial institutions and law enforcement uh, did that book just say there's no place for you in this future? It's great. I'm a disaster. This is, can only be a good thing. Others have argued that people living under third level conditions will be immune to such infirmities as hunger, disease, and mental illness. Why did I even lose a mental point? I'm enough of a sorry cop to say a cab as a cop. In some of his later writings, Nielsen himself speculated about the potential for an extra physical architecture that disregards the laws of bourgeois physics and instead relies on the revolutionary faith of the people for structural integrity that's not what no no physics still true Ooh. meaning the buildings stay up because people believe they'll stay up precisely Nielsen observed that the financial system operates on the same principle of faith. So why not an architectural system? Now we know why these motherfuckers were stacking matchboxes in a stupid, useless pattern and then being like, our will will hold them up. They genuinely think that communism is going to give them telekinesis? On the following page, you come across a few black and white reproductions from Nielsen's own notebooks. One sketch depicts a government ministry shaped like a great inverted pyramid. A hectare in width at the top, balanced atop foundations the size of common apartments. Another depicts a leaning tower wrapped in a dramatic helix. The caption beneath it reads, The Tower of History. I mean, just ignoring the fantastical shapes that are terrifying and how much I just I hate the idea of ever being in a building that just has like a part that hangs out over an abyss like those like H shaped buildings where it's like two towers but then there there's like a, a middle part where they join together for some reason it's like I hate how that whole middle part's just floating over an abyss and I would never want to be in that part of the building and that concept just bothers me but uh just think about how much of a pain in the ass as it is to navigate those kinds of places like all those like elevators go up and down so if there's parts of the place that don't go up and down you gotta do some some weird shit to get around like it starts to feel like having to like fly across the country and like deal with like one part of the country versus another where it's like you gotta like do like like transfers in the airport but it's like you just trying to get to a part of a building like this is unnecessary we don't need that but also, all these ideas are bad. Something about that tower looks awfully familiar. Could it be that's what the students were trying to recreate with the matchboxes? They're trying to create a helix out of boxes and then they just hold it up with their mind. I feel like it'd be easier just to start with levitation. <laughs> Wait, but if the people stop believing, 
What if the people stop believing and the buildings collapse? In the corner of one of the reproduced notebook pages, you can make out the following words, written in Nielsen's distinctive slashing script. I know his handwriting? A state that has lost the faith of its people has forfeited the right to exist. It's... <laughs> I hate to side with the mass murderer for a second, but I think he might have um, been speaking in metaphor, <laughs> and his followers might be idiots <laughs> that might have like not understood. They're like the aliens from like what? Never give up, never surrender. Whatever that movie was with, with like Tim Allen, the aliens that take everything literally and don't understand metaphor or fiction. So like. He's he spoke in evocative terms, assuming you were smart enough to get what he meant, and you were like, "Man, that means you can literally levitate things with your mind, and if you stop believing in something, it'll literally collapse." It's like, no, it'll 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 figure it'll figuratively collapse. the The building isn't literally held up by your, your mind; it's just kind of held up by your mind because everyone believing in the thing is what makes the 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 thing happen. Is I, it is it is a lot. still feel like the more applicable concept though if for this ideology that we're talking about here even if through its warped lens still feels closer to anarchism than communism which admittedly aren't entirely massively separate from each other but the whole like anarchism really depends on the idea of everyone collectively believing in it and working toward and working in that system and allowing for it to be that way is it don't got no hierarchies? Plausible or not, there's something beautiful about this idea. Is there any more? There is no more. You've reached the outer theoretical limits of communism. <laughs> and in less than 200 pages. Yeah. It's consistently concise. If you'd like to read further, may we recommend a brief look at Occidental Architecture? Put it away. Well, it's 2 a.m. And if I... Nah, that joke doesn't work. I was gonna say, like, if you know, if I had done this last night, it probably would have been 2 a.m. in real life, too. My, gear, my grades are trash this semester. Maybe it's because you're trying to balance matchbooks with your mind. I mean... It's, it's like, it's fun to believe in something sometimes. Yes, exactly. You didn't say anything. Or I guess he said his grades are bad. Do you know his grades? It's fun to all believe in something and take a leap, like in safety not guaranteed, but uh, this is this might be a bit far. I can't tell what they're saying to each other. You're back. I'm ready. Let's talk about inframaterialism. Yes. Let's get right to it. You're letting me do this even though it's 2.01 a.m.? Okay. His companion leans forward, ready to jump in. This lets me skip over doing an entire 24-hour cycle again and figuring out how to pay for my room tonight. They're impressed that you dove right into the most advanced parts of the theory. Half an hour evaporates and the conversation is still wending its way toward new and unexpected places. A cool breeze coming off the bay wraps itself around the Capeside apartments in a nearly forgotten part of that glorified construction site, surrounded by rusted pieces of scaffolding and walls of faded tarpaulin. A detective of the RCM debates the intricacies of an abstruse theory with a pair of university students. But I'm still trying to figure out how the pale fits into all this. The two phenomena are actually deeply intertwined. Many inframaterialists believe that pale is actually a manifestation of nostalgia and historical inertia. Those same theorists have hypothesized that revolution may in fact create a counterforce that prevents the pale from expanding. Now the breeze has subsided. All is still except for the last bits of steam rising from the coffee pot. Well, on that note, I think we're gonna call it an evening. No, wait. Can this really be the end? You feel like you've just gotten to the real stuff. Yes. 
One of our better discussions lately, on the whole. Hang on, is is that it? What do you mean, is that it? You've done the reading, we talked about it. What more do you expect from a reading group? What if I have more questions, you know, about communism? Well, you could always ask, I guess. The two young, the two young men look at each other a moment. He probably won't get a better chance, honestly. But it's getting late. So maybe pick the most important question. Uh, Kim, what should I ask? Detective, how should I know what questions you have about communism? Uh... Uh, showed him the rifle, did all the reading. Wow, that's actually a really high chance for a 15. I asked the most important question about all of communism. <gasps> the question you mean to ask is both very complicated and incredibly simple. If we can't even agree whether communism is about plasma or psychology or beans... The young man waits patiently for you to finish. And we waste all our time arguing over who's secretly a liberal or not. Yes. Say it. What's the point? The young man considers your words for a minute. You're witnessing his ironic armor melt before you. This is his true self you're seeing now. There's something going on in there, but his innermost sanctum is still beyond your reach. The theorist Puncher and Watman, not inframaterialists, but theorists nonetheless, say that communism is a secular version of Perikanasian theology, that it replaces faith in the divine with faith in humanity's future. I have to say, I've never entirely understood what they mean, but I think maybe the answer is in there, somewhere. But what if humanity keeps letting us down? Nobody said fulfilling the proletariat's historic role would be easy. It demands great faith with no promise of tangible reward. But that doesn't mean we can simply give up. Even when they shoot at us? Especially then. And of course, we'll be shooting right back. So young. So unbearably young. I guess you could say we believe it because it's impossible. It's our way of saying we refuse to accept that the world has to remain. Like this. Unfinished. Yes, that's a good way to think of it. A work in progress. I don't know if I believe it, though. You've got to believe in something. Otherwise, what are you doing? Devon, it's getting pretty late. I got myself organized. You're right. We should clean this up and get going. He gestures to the matchboxes. Of course, the matchboxes. You'd very nearly forgotten to ask about them. Now may be your last chance. Oh my god, can I do my concentrated communism powers to actually make the matchboxes work? <laughs> After all this nonsense, we then, like, with the power of three of us, make it consistent and, and make it structurally sound and it works. And you're like, what? It's real. Like the, fa like the phasmid. The matchboxes. You were trying to make the tower from Nielsen's journals. So you really did read all the way to the end. Yeah. Uli and I were trying to see whether there was enough plasm between the two of us to hold up a few matchboxes. It was just a little informal experiment. No reason to take it too seriously. We should try again. All of us. The young man looks at you a moment, then at his companion. What could it hurt? All right, let's give it another go. Do it, do it, do it, do it. You know what? I'll sit this one out. I don't think you want my skeptical materialism interfering. Kim, we need you. Before long, a modest tower begins to rise from the pile of matchboxes. God, what a nightmare. You place every box with the utmost delicacy and precision. Easy, Uli. 
It's holding. It's holding. The higher the tower goes, the quieter the room seems to become. Aside from the occasional comment, the three of you are completely absorbed by the task. All right, you go next, Stepan. The young man pushes back his shirt sleeves, revealing the pale flesh of his forearms. It's high stakes ideological Jenga. Easy now. Is it? He's holding. He's holding. Yes, this is the closest we've ever gotten. It's almost exactly as Nielsen's sketch imagined. A physical manifestation of the dialectical spiral of history. Oh my god, look at it go. All right, gendarme. Your turn. I'm an interfacing god. You've got this. <gasps> Theories aside, they're only matchboxes. Interfacing my hero. Even the lieutenant is watching intently now. <laughs> Ghost of Mazov, give me strength. It's... It's... No. Ah. Well. That'll pretty much prep you for a whole life of disappointments. Well, it may be that we found the outermost limit of our capabilities under the prevailing regime. Undoubtedly. Alternatively, it could be that our own ideological fervor is still insufficient. Yes, the problem is almost certainly your lack of commitment and not, say, gravity. Harder to believe, but still possible. Either way, that's enough barter games for one night. Thanks for humoring us. We should probably clean up. Well, I think we're probably finished here, Detective. Well, I guess we're off. Wait a minute, if you don't mind. We wanted to get your opinion on something. A few little changes we've been thinking about. What kind of changes? Nothing too major, I think. We were talking potentially about relaxing some parts of our admissions process. Maybe you should ditch the past phrases and meet in a coffee house. Hmm. I thought the cloak and dagger routine made us seem more appealing. I thought so too, but perhaps we overdid it, just a little. There was another thing. We were also debating putting up some posters around town. Though some of us maintain that advertising is an unacceptably bourgeois tactic. That's what makes it so beautiful. The irony is unbeatable. <clears throat> As a noted art cop, you definitely have an opinion on this. <laughs> Think of it this way, you're appropriating bourgeois methods for revolutionary ends. Oh, I like that. We're dismantling the structures of capital with our own tools. Hmm, it does sound pretty cool when you describe it like that. Plus, I've got the perfect place in mind. Put some more coffee on, Uli. We've got a long night ahead of us. We should probably get Cindy in here too. Oh, and Gendarme, one last thing. About that question you asked earlier, it reminded me of a certain poem that you might appreciate. Ah, so he has read something besides his books of abstruse theory. It was written by a young communard who was killed on the barricades during the coalition landings. The story goes that he wrote it on the last night of his life, keeping watch from the barricades in the middle of the night. I don't have the whole thing committed to memory, but there's a line in it I think about sometimes. What's the line? In dark times, should the stars also go out? Anyway, good night to you. In dark times, should the stars also go out? 
Huh. The girl from the seven, I promised she would stop by. Hmm. I wonder what that means. What the implication of that is. I think we're all out of Thursday quests, so that was... I think that means we finished this one up completely. It's weird getting a snapshot of where I was whenever this was in the game. Yeah, get yourself organized. We did it. We met with a, with a book group, we read a book, and then we... talked about the book. And it was pretty nice. <laughs> it's kind of the entire game in microcosm, I suppose, and I leveled up. I wonder if you could have ever won. I mean, it, I think it said I succeeded with my interfacing check, and it's, not, and it's one of the only things I'm good at, so... I think it was just doomed from the start. But yeah, no, this is a... <laughs> I think doing a Let's Play of this game is a book club in its own right, when we think about it. That's the feeling it has, as all the comments are all circling around it, and we're all discussing what, it, what we're seeing, and... We're all having our different reactions to, like, the the billionaire that bends light and time and space around him and so on. And, uh... The difference of the asymmetry... The, uh... The asymmetrical time aspect of this and how it's left behind leads to people yelling at me about things years after I originally said them. <laughs> uh, this I get fucking comments on part three of the series every day it feels like still going on about the fucking cup and everyone has a different reaction both to the cup and my reactions to the cup and it's just this big cipher and so on the specific like choke points that people go on about it's uh it's an experience i want the fucking book give me the book za za um za zaum whatever your company's name is the the whatever it's called too I forget what's called it's not easy it's not an easy to remember book name but like there's a book that there's a disco Elysium book I think it uh I think it's like a collection of like tabletop game sessions uh, adapted into a novel or something and I think that it might actually it might have predated disco Elysium it might be what disco Elysium is based on or something like that but uh we're still waiting. It was supposed to come out in 2020 in English, and it still hasn't, I don't think. And I'm like, give it to me! I just want more of your writing. <laughs> I'll take it, even without the game. But I, I think this is it. This makes me really curious about this storyline with each of the other uh, playthroughs. This is an interesting way to, to uh, increase the replay value of this game. I've heard... Uh, kind of like opposite extremes, honestly. There are people that claim that Disco Elysium has like no replay value, partly because the mystery is... the mystery itself is so set in stone. Uh, and we, like, once you know the answer, it's like, that's what it was. And you, and you realize how kind of pointless a huge amount of the game was if you only view it through the lens of the mystery, which is just not how I view it, so I don't really care in, the, in those terms. Uh... I don't, it's like when people say move, look at scenes in movies and they're like, this part was pointless because it didn't contribute to the final part of the plot at the at climax. And it's like, yeah, but was it world building or character building or like, did it have other values besides that? Because that's not all, like, not all of film and fiction and so on is like a heist movie where there's like the big X thing that has to be executed and everything is a part of the plan building up to that exact moment or whatever. Like, that's just not how well storytelling has to be. So I didn't quite agree with that, but the sheer volume of writing in this game and uh, how much of it is like more or less exposition that you'd have to repeat mostly identically with just little interspersed reactions here and there from your different stats, uh, having different context and so on. It is a lot of the same experience as at least how I would, that's how I would guess it would be like so I see, I see both perspectives a bit there, because yeah, like the having a completely different build changes stuff, and you can make different choices and so on. But a lot of it would still play out pretty similarly, and a lot of the text, like by volume, would be the same-ish. If nothing else, I guess it just benefits for me to to wait a year or two, which I've already have, I've already waited a year, uh, to play again, because then at least it's just like 
not immediately uh it's not all immediately apparent what's new and what's old and so i'm not like okay here's this discussion again it's like it'll be like a refresher and so on and so like i think some time helps but having ideological storylines like this is definitely one way to increase the replay value because it's like oh here's an entire quest that you can only access that's like two hours long you can only access it based on what ideology you had which means that's like a little bit of value for up to four playthroughs essentially since you can only you because there's four primary ideologies for you to specialize from playthrough to playthrough and all that right over here and I have a lot of communist points in this playthrough. And so that's interesting. It'd also be cool if they had like a storyline tied to each of the cop type, the capo types, and so on. Just to like double up on that a little bit, which I don't think they did. But you know, this is still pretty good for like for free content added to a game afterwards, in addition to the voice acting and all that. I'm really curious about them in part because they seem to be like metaphorical interrogations of a critique of each ideology in this in essence so it's not about just direct uh, directly engaging with the the nitty-gritty details of the ideology but instead almost this whimsical fairy tale like parallel story and I imagine they're all really humanizing and really in, like interesting to go through and I'm I'm almost a little sad that I'll probably only ever see two of them in my playthroughs because I, 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 I don't think I'm doing four playthroughs of this game. Maybe I'll have to... Maybe once I've fully closed... Maybe once I'm confident that I've closed the book on this game and I won't be like spoiling future playthroughs by looking stuff up, I might just watch the other two online or something. I'm really curious what the fascism one's going to be because if that's the direction I go in next time, it just feels like because it, it just feels like the polar opposite is the way to go for your second playthrough. Uh, it just, I'm... <laughs> I just hope it's not just fucking attending a rally and it's really dark and horrifying. I hope it maybe just shows in an empathic way the, uh... Let's say the kind of, like, misgu misguided fears that these pe the, the people have when they fall into these ideologies and you, and you kind of like get how they got there even if you're still worried by the things they're saying because that's kind of the real life t version of it you have people that just like espouse just worrying ideologies but when you know them well you, you're just like you kind of see the bizarre inner workings of it and how they're often just working from a place of like selfishness or fear or have just basically been lied to and so on I don't know humans are generally better people than the darkest things they collectively do there's a note I guess <laughs> I think we're uh, I think we're all wrapped up I'll see you guys next time